Well, good morning. It's good to be back here in beautiful Virginia. Uh, Kathy and I were away uh, last week uh, in California visiting our son, uh, Jesse, and his wife. And I can tell you that watching uh, Zach on TV was not like being here. Uh, I, I tell you plainly, I don't like watching church online. It was uh, not the same thing. Now, of course, we got to go worship uh, with, with uh, Jesse's local body there out in, um, outside of Sacramento, California. Um, but I uh, appreciate so much uh, Brother Zach filling the pulpit uh, faithfully last week. And thank you, Zach, for that. And uh, uh, it, it is good to be back. I went to church out there, Kath and I did, and it's unique, a uh, very large church we went to. And as uh, soon as we walked in, we sat down, and, and uh, it was about five minutes till, and, and it probably sits six or 700 people. They have two services, and um, uh, it was like 80% empty. And then <laughs> before the first song was over, the place couldn't find a seat. Uh, I guess that they do in California, everything kind of fast. They get out there, and they sit down, and uh, they turn the lights down. As soon as the music came on, lights went down. I'm going, uh-oh, whoa, <laughs> and lights went out. Um, they did two songs, and then a pastor got up and kind of did, uh, he talked a little bit, uh, one of the associate pastors, and they came up and sang a couple more songs, and then the uh, senior pastor came up, and I'm going to tell you, I was blessed. Uh, the, 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 the young man's name uh, was Scott Hollingshead. He is a graduate of Master Seminary, John MacArthur Seminary down in Southern California, and uh, they kept the lights on when he preached. Uh, and uh, he did an outstanding job. And any time that I can walk away from sermon and I'm still thinking about it seven days later, I know that God used that in my life. And he was preaching out of Colossians, and he preached on uh, Paul being a prisoner and asking for prayers to present the gospel. And he was talking about us and our responsibility. And, th and this is a quote from Scott Hollingshead, uh, from that pastor, and it will stick with me the rest of my life. He said, if the, if, the, if the gospel is in you, is it coming out of you? Is the gospel in you? And if it is in you, it better be coming out of you. And I thought, wow, that was so profound. I, 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 took, I took tons and tons of notes. Uh, he, I asked my daughter-in-law, I said, how long does he preach? And he goes, oh, he's real long, 45 minutes to an hour. I said, oh. <laughs> He could come fill our pulpit. <laughs> but, uh, no, it was, it was a blessing to be there. I do want to share a couple things with you guys before we get into the sermon today. One of those is the men's uh, camping trip. It will be the third annual camping trip that we have. The camping part has been post is canceled, the camping part. Or they're expecting rain on uh, Friday and Saturday. But we will be having the event here. So from 5 o'clock to 7 is fellowship. Um, Bill... And um, Tim Bailey uh, and Bill Mullaney, they're going to be cooking up uh, a manly meal for us. If you went to, similar to what we did at, the, at, at David Fuller's house, so hey, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, smoked barbecue and beef and, and looking forward to that. So 5 to 7, and then we will eat from 7 to 8, and then from 8 to 9 will be how Moser will speak to us. And if, if the weather is permitting it, uh, we'd love to be able to go outside and have a, a fire outside, do just like we do if we were out there uh, in Cumberland camping, we just do it here on our campus. There will be nothing on Saturday morning, uh, so it'll all happen Friday night. Please, please, if you haven't signed up, go online, sign up uh, for the men's conference. If, if now you don't have to travel as far, maybe uh, your work schedule prohibited you from driving out there that evening, uh, we would love to have you. We're looking forward to it. Also, uh, two weeks from today, I will be beginning uh, our uh, joint Sunday school class, and basically it's GHBC DNA. And uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not calling it a new members class for that because everybody in the church should go through it. So I'm talking about DNA. What, what makes us Grace Harvest Baptist Church? And I will be going our, through our doctrine. Uh, the first session will be an introduction. It will be given a history of our church. And uh, I'll get in to talk about uh, you know, why we do what we do here in our leadership. And so uh, I, I would encourage you, please come. I've asked the, the folks that uh, we will continue with uh, the new members class this week. They'll be finishing up in a couple weeks. And I've asked them to volunteer and step in during the Sunday school hour to help in the uh, children's uh, Sunday school hour so that it'll free up teachers. And the idea is to get every member of the church on the same page 
uh, and then ever all new members will go through this before membership. So uh, please be in prayer for that. I'm looking forward to that as well. This morning we we are in uh, the book of Revelation again in chapter 19. If you turn in your Bibles there with me. Uh, we sang this morning. And uh, some of you have probably said uh, the Lord's Prayer this week. And uh, in that song we sang and then the Lord's Prayer, one of the one things that we always ask for is for whose kingdom to come. And that's God's kingdom. We pray for that. May we see your kingdom come. So I'm going to ask you that question as we get into Revelation chapter 19 this morning. We're going to be talking about that very thing. The return of the king. Uh, some of you, and you saw my email, I, I said that some of you may be Lord of the Ring fans. My wife is not a Lord of the Ring fans. And uh, so when I made reference to the return of the king, she's like, what? What, what does that have to do with anything? I said, well, baby, it's the return of our king, not the king in a Tolkien's novel. And uh, unlike the movie, it will not be three and a half hours long today. <laughs> so don't fret. Um, but we will be, we'll be diving into uh, the return of Christ. This is the climax of human history, if you will. Uh, you know, um, so Rome, um, excuse me, Revelation Chapter 19, verse 11. If you would stand with me, please, as we honor the preaching of God's word, if you were able, please stand as we honor the word. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sits on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, having name written on him which no one knows except himself, and being clothed with a garment dipped in blood. His name is also called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the wrath of the rage of God the Almighty. And he has on his garment and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in midheaven, Come, assemble for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of commanders, and the flesh of strong men, and the flesh of horses, and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and slaves, and small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war with him who sits on the, on the horse and with his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who did the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which came from the mouth of him who sits on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Father God, we have come, as your people gathered here today, to worship you. We have done that, Father, in our fellowship. We have done it during the Sunday school hour. We have done it, Father, in our lifting up our voices as one as we've praised your holy name. And, Father, we've given of our first fruits back unto you, Lord. All that you have given to us, we return a portion of that to worship you, Father. And now we come to the proclamation of the word. Father, I pray for your people gathered here this morning and listening online, that they would be encouraged by this, Father. Not frightened, but encouraged. And, Father, that the final victory is what we will study and see today in this passage of Scripture. But I pray, Father, for the one, and woe be to the one who's gathered in this place today that does not know you as Lord and Savior. Because they will suffer the wrath of God if they die without your Son as Savior. I pray, Father, that even this hour you would turn a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. I ask this in the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. So before we get into the sermon today, I want to do a little bit of review and remind you of what has happened up to this point. We have um, seen that the, uh, in the beginning that the seven seals, at the beginning of the tribulation period, uh, they included the appearance of the Antichrist, the great warfare, famine, plague, the martyrdom of believers in Christ, a devastating earthquake that caused severe and devastating 
results. That was all in chapter 6. And then those who survived the six seals are right to cry out, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of the, their wrath has come, and who can stand? Here are these people that have gone through the six seals, and they're still shaking their fist at God. And then the seventh seal, as you remember, introduces the seven trumpet judgments. And the trumpets included hail and fire that destroyed much of the plant life in the world, the death of much of the world's aquatic life, the darkening of the sun and the moon, a plague of demonic locusts that tortured the unsaved, and the, the march of the demonic army that kills a third of humanity. All that was in Revelation 8 and Revelation 9. And then the seventh trumpet calls forth seven angels who carry the seven bowls of wrath. We find in Revelation chapter 11 and in chapter 15, the bold judgments include painful sores afflicted on humanity, the death of every living thing in the, in the sea, the turning of the rivers to blood, an intensifying of the sun's heat, a great darkness uh, and an infestation of sores from the first bowl, and then the advance of the Antichrist armies onto Armageddon, which we studied three weeks ago, and then a devastating earthquake followed by great hailstones. All of that we have preached through and walked through every one of those. If you've missed that, you can go back and listen to it online. But now we get to that part of, of the world's history where the return of the king is finally come. This is not a story that you share with your child who's three or four years old at bedtime to make them sleep well. This is not, I mean, it's very graphic. Matter of fact, if I was to tell my wife, hey, babe, we're going to sit here and watch a movie, and I described her what would be in that movie would be this, she'd go, oh, no, no, let's watch a rom-com. Because you're not going to want to watch this or see this, right? But this is exactly what God says is going to happen to the ungodly that stand and defy the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So this morning, I want to divide this section of Scripture into three parts. The first, we're going to talk about the rider of the white horse. And secondly, we're going to talk about the king and his armies. And third, we're going to talk about the final victory. So with me, verse 11. And then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sits on it is called Faithful and True, and, it is in, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, having a name written on him which no one knows except himself. And being clothed with a garment dipped in blood, his name is also called the Word of God. Do you grasp this, dear one? Do you, do you understand what we have just read here this morning? Th this is the climax of all human history. From the day that Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out of the garden to this day, this is the day, this is the final promise of God that he would come to reclaim what is his, rightfully his. From this day forward, the day that he returns, the second coming of Christ, for all of eternity, everyone will acknowledge him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There will be no dispute of it. There's been two other times in history that everybody who's known that God is God. That was Adam and Eve, and then after the flood, Noah and his family. That's the two times in history when everybody knew who God was. Now you talk to people and, and they scoff at you if you say that God is God and sovereign over everything, including our lives. And so here this morning we, we see that, that this, is, this is the uh, final act of the promise that God made to redeem mankind. Jesus ascended to heaven after his resurrection, some 40 days later. We know that. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father until he returns. He's there now, this morning, and to make intercession for you and I because we are his, we are co-heirs with him, and God looks on us with favor because of the righteousness that we have been bestowed on us because of the righteousness of Christ. When you became a born-again believer, when you accepted Christ as your Savior, 
Jesus now is the one who makes intercession for us. You don't have to go through any man. You don't have to call me up and sit in my office and confess your sins to me and then hopefully that I can go confess them to God for you. You, can direct, you go directly to him for that. When you want to make pleas and petitions, you go boldly to the throne of glory. You go boldly before the God in reverence and awe and fear of our Heavenly Father, knowing that Christ makes intercession for you. Not some dead, departed saint. Not your dead relative. Not your dead somebody, a friend. They're not making intercession for you. It's Christ himself who makes intercession for you. That's where Jesus is. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Now he's about to receive the kingdom that his father's promised to him. Finally, Jesus Christ will return and be the rightful heir to this world. In an earlier vision, John saw Jesus receive the title deed to earth. You remember that? Turn in your Bibles with me. Go flip back to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Scroll over there. Revelation 5 verses 1 through 7. Excuse me, 1 through 10. 1 through 10. Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sits on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And then I was, this is John writing, then I was crying greatly because no one was found worthy to open up the scroll and look on it. No one was worthy to take back the deed of the earth. And one of the elders said to me, stop crying. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw in the midst of the throne and the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, in which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sits on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, because you were slain and purchased for God with your blood people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Glory. The Lamb who came to take away the sins of the world now described as behold the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lamb now is the, is, becomes the conquering hero. Remember when Jesus went to his death on the cross not saying a word in his own defense and a sinless perfect God, fully God and fully man, was crucified for your and my sin to receive the wrath of God. He was the lamb, a meek lamb. When you picture a lamb, all of us have seen a lamb, and you see how meek and mild they are and how cute they are. And you imagine that lamb being slaughtered. Or Picture this. Imagine a group of bullies, and they see a little lamb, and they start throwing rocks at it. And, they, and then they go over and kick it, and it's bleeding and it's laying on the ground and it's crying out and these bullies keep keep doing this. Imagine that lamb turning into a lion. Because that's what Christ does. Christ is the lamb who took away the sins of the world and he was mocked and he was bullied and he was tortured and he was killed so that we could have eternal life and the wrath of God could be satisfied. But that lion, excuse me, that lamb is the lion of Judah who will return. And we have an image of that in the very passage that we read today. No more meek lion. But a king returning for his kingdom. A king who is a warrior. A king who is dripping with blood off of his garments. This is no, this is no weak, meek king. This is the creator of heaven and earth who comes finally to claim what is his. Doesn't picture in 
to those who claim that Jesus is nothing but love and he will never harm anybody. He would never send anybody to hell. He is just perfect and just, but he would never do that. That's beyond him. They always want to see Jesus as that lamb. They forget the part of scripture that says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. The lamb becomes that conquering hero. No longer is Jesus betrayed in his humiliation as Zechariah 9, 9 portrays him humble and mounted on a donkey. Humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The son of God riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And yet we see a picture here of this Savior, of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, not riding a donkey, but riding a white horse. A victorious Roman general in their triumphant processions through the streets of Rome would always ride on a white horse at the, at the beginning of his legions. The horse's rider here is called faithful and true. For John declared in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. He is the only one that has a right to judge. Not you, not I. Only he has the right to judge a man's salvation. We are told that Jesus returns to be the righteous judge and warrior. A ju as judge, he must and he will pronounce a sentence against those who have opposed him in his truth. If you're sitting here this morning and you don't know Christ as Savior, you are an enemy of God. If he was to come back now and take his people, if you still rejected him and you live through the tribulation period and you see this final thing, know that God will come and he will destroy you and sentence you to hell forever. The time of salvation is now. The time is not to wait and to think that you have all your life. The Bible tells us the day is the day of salvation. You don't know what tomorrow will bring Who's, who will be here this, this next Sunday that's not here this Sunday. And as a warrior, he will carry out the sentence of judgment. Jesus is faithful to his promise, and what he says always comes true. Even, in, even when he walked with his disciples, do you guys not get it? I, 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 I have to go to Jerusalem. I have to suffer. I have to die. But in three days I will rise again. And what did they say? Oh, what's going on? And when he rose from the dead, they're all like, what? What happened? Folks, we've got the word of God that tells us what's coming. And yet, so many of us live a life of fear and trembling. And don't understand, you're already victorious. We should be the boldest people on the fate of the earth when it comes to promoting our Lord and our Savior. As that pastor said to me last week, to the congregation there, Mark, if the gospel's in you, is it coming out of you? Do people see it in you? And folks, let me here to tell you, it doesn't good just to live the gospel. Nobody's going to get saved just by watching you live a Christian life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You need to tell people about Jesus. You need to tell about your Lord, about your Savior. You need to tell them in love that sin is sin. I was sharing this with some people. I was fascinated by a sermon Vody Bachman did. And uh, he started off by saying, hey, uh, this, it, it just caught me by surprise. He just said, hey, I just want to let you know that uh, I have some friends that are wife beaters. And, um, and, and I'm not here to bash wife, wife beaters. Yeah, but I, I know they're good people. And I'm sitting there scratching my head as he started. And I'm like, where is he going with this? And he said, but isn't it the way we start every sermon when we talk about homosexuality? Bam. Or fornication. Or adultery. Or you name your sin in there. We always try to make excuses so we don't offend people. Folks, the gospel is offensive. Amen. It is to draw somebody to the place where they look inside their heart and they see they have sinned against the Holy God. And they realize they cannot save themselves. And that God has sent His Son to save them. He's the only one. God hates sin. And folks, i got news for you. The Bible tells us He hates sinners. Oh, that's not popular to hear that, is it? He's calling you to salvation, to his love. But when you're on outside of that, the Bible describes you as an enemy of God. Not his friend. Jesus said, remember he called, you called me Lord, but now you are my friends. We are his brothers and sisters in Christ. Everything that God has promised to Jesus, he promises to us. 
Don't tell people that God will let love them just the way they are. He will receive them to salvation just the way they are when they repent. But he will not re let them remain in their sin. We, we, you can't do that. Christian, that, 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 is, that is not the gospel. The gospel is that we're sinners in need of a Savior. And Jesus is the one that came to save us. We're talking about the wrath of God today. You see, the wrath of God will be satisfied. It was satisfied for you as a believer. It wasn't done away with. God didn't say, oh, oh, there's no wrath against you. Of course there was wrath against us. Who paid that price? Jesus did. Jesus paid the anger that God had against your sin, the righteous judgment against sin. We got mercy. You receive mercy when you accept Christ. These people we're talking about today, the people who deny Christ and reject God, they will receive the wrath. They will receive justice. And they will spend eternity in hell apart from Him. We have the message of hope and love, and we need to share it. The problem is the world has flipped upside down. Folks, we are, we are no longer in, a, in a, a, a place in this, even this country or the world. Well, let's, let's talk about America for a minute. We're no longer in that place when you had two parties that just opposed each other, and you really, really wasn't much difference of them. Not much when I was growing up. Not much. But now... You have a Congress split by party line that every member of one party votes to protect women and say that transgender deviants cannot participate in sports other than the gender that they're assigned at birth. So in other words, a male cannot say I'm a woman and go compete and take all the accolades away from women. Everybody on the Republican side of that voted Yes, we're going to pass this. Every Democrat voted against it. What in the world have we come to? When, 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 you're, when you say that a, a man saying he could be a woman can participate in that. We've lost our minds. And, but the world says there's something wrong with you. That, that you have a problem. No, 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 no. I love a person enough to tell him the emperor has no clothes on. I love you enough to say to you, if you were to come into my office and say, Pastor, you just don't understand, uh, I, I, I was born a male, but, but, but I'm a woman. God didn't make a mistake. You were born a man, you're a man. You were born a woman, you're a woman. You're, the deviance that we have accepted as normal has been nothing ever seen in this country before. Not seen in the world before, because there's been perversion like this in the world before. And God warns us about it. And, and, and it, it starts with simple things like that. How many of you all heard of the, the Jesus Seminar that was around in the 70s? Anybody heard about that? Um, I encourage you to do some more research on it. I'll give you some fa facts about it. Robert Funk was a, was a biblical New Testament scholar, a liberal scholar. Uh, and it was his desire to discover the historical Jesus the, the, that was hidden, the that, that he believed because for 2,000 years, basically, it's, it's been myth and tradition and legend that has, has, has formed our view of who Christ is. Uh, the agenda of the Jesus Seminar was not to discover who the historical Jesus was, but rather the purpose of this seminar was to attack what the Bible clearly says about who Jesus is and what he taught. They concluded, this, these group of biblical scholars concluded that 80% of the words that Jesus spoke in the Bible were not true. I don't know how they decided 20% were, but the 80% didn't. Um, this result of type of thinking led us to what we have today and called progressive Christianity. It is not Christianity. Many of you here in this church have, uh, we, we, uh, we, we showed it in Sunday school, the, the uh, progressive Christianity, where they come from, what they think. But I want to share with you some things uh, about them in just a moment. I, I want to, well, I'll go right into it. I want to share with you four traits of, the, of a progressive Christian theology. The first is pro, uh, progressive Christianity has a low view of Christ. They have a low view of Jesus. The orthodox view of Jesus, of course, is that he is the divine son of God, part of the Trinity, one person of the Trinity, one God, three persons. And... Um, that they believe you should 
worship him in adoration and he should be praised, but not as the Son of God. But of course, that's not what uh, we believe. We believe, obviously, that he is the Son of God and he is to be praised for that very thing. They believe that Jesus is so much a divine Son of God, but rather just a moral example, almost like a Gandhi. He, he was a good person. He said good things, and we should live like him. Secondly, progressive Christianity is focused on moralism, not salvation. Uh, doing good things, doing righteous things. If you don't have any sort of sense of Jesus as someone to be worshipped, then he's just someone to be emulated. So that their highest goal, then, they believe, for the Christian life, is to just be a good person. Just, just be a good person. Do the best you can. Um, you should just uh, be kind to your neighbor. You should re uh, really um, disregard the, the gospel of salvation uh, because they don't believe that you even have to believe in Jesus. Uh, point number three, progressive Christianity downplays our fallenness. They don't believe in the original sin. People aren't really that fallen and they're not really that bad. How many times have you heard that? How many times have you heard people get on television and say, whether it's a politician or somebody else, and say, you know, I know that people are really just generally good. Well, folks, I know me and I know I'm not generally good. I, I, it didn't, it, it, maybe it was just me, but when I read scripture and it said, uh, the heart of a, a, of a man is to do evil from his youth, I'm going, okay, I can raise my hand to that one. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I, I know that in myself, if I'm left to my own source, I'm always, it's always going to be about Mark Wells. It's always going to be about me. Even Jesus said, uh, don't the ungodly, don't they treat their families well, the people they love? Of course, because it's about them. Why, why is divorce so prevalent in, in, in the world today? Why is it so easy for somebody just to, you know, babe, I love you and I will love you forever. Three years later, forever's over. Why? Because they're not, the other person's not satisfying their needs anymore. How, how many times have you heard this? Well, we've grown apart. Grow apart? Wait a minute. You know that the Bible tells you, and if you sat through Pastor Mark's pre-marriage counseling, you would have heard, you become one flesh. There is no growing apart. You become one flesh. God says to become one. To become one. But see, you've got to believe what God has to say in order to believe that. And so progressive Christianity downplays all of that. They don't, they don't, and finally fourth, they don't believe in hell. Well, that's real convenient. <laughs> don't believe in hell is, well, you know, what's the big deal? Even if you don't believe this, you're not going to go to hell. The primary view of heaven and hell in the progressive church is universalism, which is the idea that no one will be punished in hell and that everyone eventually will be saved and restored to a right relationship with God. Some progressive Christians will st still say that Jesus is the only way, but believe that even if you don't believe in him, you will be saved somehow. The Pope said that years ago. When they asked him, they they asked him, he said, well, what about Muslims and what about uh, Hindus? And I said, oh, yeah, they, basically if they believe in their gods and they live a good life, then, then God will say, what? What? The people want to tell me that the Roman Catholic Church is Christian. It's not Christian, folks. I, I was saved out of that, and I know many of you were saved out of it. Anything that adds to my salvation, anything that adds to my salvation other than Christ and him alone is straight from the pits of hell. The lies that the world tells about Christ is going to all come crashing down here. The description of Jesus as faithful and true is, is in marked contrast with the unfaithfulness and the lies of Satan. The lies of the Antichrist and his evil empire and the wicked people that are here on the earth. This will all come crashing down upon them. Their lies that they believe will all, the house of cards will come tumbling down. The very fact that he is coming again, he has promised, confirms that Jesus is faithful and true. His eyes here are described as flames of fire. Jesus sees all and knows all. 
His gaze penetrates any facade people put up. No one can hide from him. Nobody can hide from God. His wrath will expose all those who have lived in rebellion toward him. There will be no hiding from God. None at all. So I ask you this question this morning, dear one. The Lord sees and knows all. What does he see when he looks at you and me? What, is, what does God see when he looks at us? When he looks at the life that you lived this past week? What does he see? Does he see a man, a woman, or a young person that loves him? That's not perfect. We'll never be perfect this side of heaven. We will still sin, but we are forgiven for that sin, and we will go on our knees before a holy God and confess that sin to him. The sin that we commit never, never, ever will cause you to lose your salvation. It, we've talked about this before. It, it affects our relationship with Christ. When you're in sin, how many of you want to come to church when you're in sin? <laughs> How many of you want to read your Bible when you're in sin and you're enjoying sin? How, how, many, how many want to have a God talk conversation with somebody? You know, one of the reasons that, that uh, uh, your pastor uh, is just, he's just as weak as any man in here or woman in here. And I can sin just as easily. You know, one of the things that I put around me as a barrier is that I constantly hold myself accountable to you as a church family. And to those who know me and when I disciple with them, I, I expect you to hold me accountable. And I speak to the elders of this church. There's four of four of us, six of us. So five of the six I talk to every day. I don't get to talk to Brian as much because I don't know when he's sleeping and when he's working. But, I, but, but one of the reasons I do that is to hold myself accountable. It's hard to be in sin when you're having God talk conversation with other people, isn't it? It's hard to be in sin when you're praying for other people. It's hard to be in sin when you're being held accountable. And so I would encourage you, Christian, have accountability partners. Have somebody that knows you and knows when there's something wrong with you. I used to say all the time uh, when we first started the church way back in 2006 and Penny and Tom were with us and Sheila and Steve and, and Betsy Atkins and, and uh, uh, Crystal. And uh, I, I remember back then if, if I would come in on Sunday morning and Penny would look at me, she goes, what's wrong, Pastor? There's something different about you. That's good. Isn't that good when people can read you like that? They know you well enough. Be, let yourself be uh, exposed like that to other people. Let people be able to see you. Uh, let them see you live for your life for Christ. And so that when you go through valleys in your life, you know that you can have those people to go to. You don't have to fall into deep sin. You, you struggle with something. And, 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 and you have that brother or sister there that you can call up and know that they're not going to judge you, but pray for you and be there with you and walk you through that valley. Oh, it is so important, dear one. Christ sees us. He knows what we're thinking. We can't hide it from him. He knows his sheep. You know, you're, you're part of that flock. If you're a Christian here this morning, you are part of his flock. Isn't it great? To know that you are cared for by the great shepherd. The perfect shepherd. That no wolf can do any harm to you. Nothing can happen to you outside of the shepherd's will. Oh, what great comfort and peace we should have in that dear one. That even when our very lives are taken from us. That to leave this life is to be in, pre to be in the presence of the Lord. I shared with the earlier service this morning, Kathy and I went to visit Kevin Lanham. He's back in the hospital again. You know our brother suffers uh, from cancer. And um, he, had, he had to go into the hospital again. He was, just came out a couple of weeks ago. And um, you thought I would have been the one that was sick and not Kevin with his attitude. And his, and his just his, the, the joy in his face. The light that he represents was shining out of him. I don't mean literally shining out of him, figuratively. Was, and and I, I opened up the Valley of Vision and I read from the Valley of Vision to him. He said, oh, Pastor, he said, I, I love the Valley of Vision. He said, we, my wife and I, Janet, we read that every day. There's some in there I don't like. I skip over them. But I, I, I read those every day. And I'm encouraged by that. And, and 
It is just amazing to me. They, and, then, and then he started, I said, hey, Janet, yeah, tell me how y'all met. And, and she, then she went in that story. I'm not going to share that because we're, we're live here. Uh, t- talk about how they met. But she said one thing. She said he was called the Bible man. The Bible man. He, he, he worked down at Fort Lee. She worked down at Fort Lee. He always had a Bible in his hand. He was always talking about Jesus. Don't you wish people would say that about you? The people that know you, would they describe you as a person who loves the Lord and, and, and has a, a passion for the loss? That's Kevin. He's going through a valley. Unless the Lord intervenes, Kevin's time is not long. And yet, his concern is for the gospel. His concern is for his ministry at the nursing home that he's not able to do anymore. See, that's a man who loves Jesus. That's a man who's not afraid of his walk with Christ. He's not a perfect man. But he's a man who desires to be faithful until the end. See, Christ has him here for a reason. He has each of us here for a reason. We have breath in our lungs today because God still has purpose in our lives. And so, being part of the flock, we have nothing to fear. His right to rule is evidenced by the many crowns he's wearing that we just read in this passage in Romans and in Revelation here, 19. Many describes him as diad- having diadems. When Jesus came to the first time, they rejected him as king. Remember that? He wasn't come to sitting uh, as earthly kingdom, even though his followers wanted him to set it up. Remember when they hung him on that cross? Pilate wrote the king of the Jews. He was the king of the Jews. But they didn't want that on there, did they? They told him, don't call him the king of the Jews. Pilate did it anyways. They did not consider Jesus their king. And those men who died without him being king are now waiting for their final judgment. Everyone who has denied the Christ from the time that he rose from the dead until this very hour that we're meeting right now, anyone who's died outside of the faith and doesn't recognize him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and received him as Lord and Savior is in the holding place waiting to be cast into the lake of fire forever. Today is a day of salvation. Now Jesus no longer wears that crown of thorns. That crown of thorns that was put upon his head. Now he wears the crown of a conqueror, of a king. Written on him is a name that no one but he himself knows. Have you ever read that before? No one knows this name that he is given. Nobody knows it. There's no reason for us to even speculate what that name is because we don't know it. It's not given to us. We know the, the name Jesus, Yeshua, was given to him by, after Gabriel told Joseph that that was what he was supposed to name him. This was the, his name as a man, but he has another name which he had before the name Jesus. It is unknown to us, but we're told what it means. It means the Word of God. It means the Word of God. It reminds us that we know only a small fraction of of what there is to know about Jesus. Just what God has allowed us to know. There's so much more about our Savior that we will not know this side of heaven. One day when we die, we will learn more about Him and our our gracious Savior. Even though there's no reason to speculate what this name is, it doesn't mean that we aren't given titles to who Jesus is. Revelation 19.13 says his name is the word of God. Revelation 19.16 says, states that the title on his robe and on his thigh is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so the writer here obviously is Jesus Christ returning to earth in glory. This is what you pray for. This is what I hope you're praying for. God tells us to pray for it, for his kingdom to come. Is that your desire to see... God come to send his son to be the rightful heir of this world to usher in the millennial kingdom, which we'll preach on next week? Is that your prayer? Or you love this world so much, you love the things of this world, you're going like, "Uh, just hold off, God. You can wait a little while longer. And you can put reasons down there all you want to. 
It, it's, it, it, it is a shame. You know, and some people, we, we think all the time that, you know, everybody has thought that Jesus is going to come back during their lifetime. I, I know that you probably thought the same thing. Well, they, saw, they thought the same thing back in the colonial times. In our, in our, this is a story. This guy's name was Colonel Davenport. This was May 19th, 1780. He was the speaker in the Connecticut House of Representatives. And they, was, they were in Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, there was this dark, ominous clouds outside. We, we've seen them. You've seen some of them ugly skies sometimes, and you're going like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Is the Lord coming back? This looks really freaky. I haven't seen that before. So you can imagine what the sky looked like. And so some of the representatives, they, they feared that the end of the world was at hand. They thought the Lord was coming back. And, and they wanted to adjoin, adjourn immediately and leave and flee and get back to their families. But Davenport rose and said this, quote, The day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there is no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish candles be brought. Rather than fearing what is to come, I will fear the Lord. Christian, is that your attitude? He's got you here for a purpose. And so we are, to, we are to desire His come, pray for His come, and we're to be found faithful until He finally comes back. So look at your own life this morning and, and, and answer the question. Only you can answer. Am I doing what God has gifted me to do? Remember, when you got saved, He gave each one of you a spiritual gift. Are you using that gift for his glory. One of the reasons that God wants you to be part of a local body is for the one another's. You can't do the one another's when you're sitting at home watching TV in your living room. Now there are people that are watching that are are providentially hindered. They can't get out of their houses. They, 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 they're, they're, they're sick or whatever. But there are other people that would rather sit in their living room and have a cup of coffee. I'll tell you right now, when I worshiped last week at home, I wasn't worshiping. I'm sitting in my living room, my two grandchildren running around. Hey, Papa! <laughs> Jesse's in the back. Hey, you want some more coffee, Dad? How about a bagel? I'm in here like, how do people do this? I'm trying to listen to Zach talk up there and paying attention to what he's preaching. And I'm constantly being distracted about what's going on. I'm thinking, why in the world would anybody want to stay in front of a TV set when they can be with a local body of believers? Well, first of all, we're called to be with local body of believers because we're to gather together. Not in your living room, but gather together. And so why? Why do we do that? So we can encourage one another. You can't encourage me if I'm in my home and you're here. I can't encourage you if you're in your home and I'm here. The body, we're to come together. You know, one of the things that I was talking to Brandon about this, and I don't know why, Maybe, I don't know why. Maybe we're becoming lazy. Your pastor's becoming lazy. I don't show up on Monday nights like I used to. We've gone from having 20 to 30 men on a night down to 10 and 11 people showing up. Why? Apathy? We've got so much going on that we, we can't come? Tired? I, I, I know I can make all kinds of excuses why I don't come. Well, the bottom line is... When we are called to this life, we are called to deny ourselves. I think somebody preached on that last week, Zach. To deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow him daily. That means we do the hard things. Now, guys, I understand, and ladies, I understand the things that come up and things. That, but is it a pattern in your life that God always takes second place? Always? Do you, do you give only from your excess? Do you only give when you have more than enough? Do you only serve when, when, well, there's nothing else to do? Do you only worship when there's nothing else to do? Do you only read your Bible when your Internet's out at home and you can't scroll through your social media post? I tell you what, folks, it, all these things, put a figure right back at me. Because I've done all of that. Done all of that. And i got to remember that I serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords who's returning. Look at verse 13. And he's being clothed with a garment dipped in blood. 
This is another evidence that he is coming as judge. And when you first think of blood, I know what I thought of when I read this passage for the first time. I'm thinking of the blood of atonement that we will celebrate as we gather around the Lord's Supper, as we drink of the fruit of the vine, and we remember that Jesus' blood atoned for our sins. That's not what this blood represents here. That's not what this blood is on his robe about, is at all. It is the blood of the slaughtered enemies. It is about judgment, not redemption. This blood is about judgment. God will judge the living and the dead. He will pour out his wrath on an ungodly world. The first time Jesus came, he was the lamb that his enemies mocked. He was tortured and he was crucified and the lamb was silent. But now that lamb turns into that, to that roaring lion. The king and his armies, verse 14. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on a white horse. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron and he treads the winepress of the wrath of the rage of God the Almighty and he has on his garment and on his thigh the name written King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Who makes up these armies that are described here? You know, um, I, I, I want to share with you that this is God's army and it, it's made up of four armies. During World War II, the United States put 13 field armies out to fight the war. There was 150,000 men in each one of these armies. We're not told how many are going to be in the number there are in these, but there, I'm going to share with you this morning, there are f at least four armies in God's armies that are listed here when it says armies. There's not one word. It's not, it's not singular. It's plural. The first army in verses 7 8 of this chapter, the bride of the Lamb. That's you and me. I know, guys, it's hard for us to remember that we're the bride, but we are the bride. And we are the first army that is described here. We're wearing white linen, fine and white linen, clean, verses 7 and 8. All Christians who died, all those that we know that died in Christ right now, all of those uh, before the tribulation make up this first army. So those who died, those, those will be the ones and raptured. So the people that are raptured... The people who die in Christ before the rapture, all of us make up this first army. The second army is the tribulation saints, the ones who receive Christ during the time of tribulation and are martyred. And chapter 7, verse 9 pictures them as wearing white robes as well. That's the second of the four armies. The third army is the Old Testament saints who are resurrected at the end of the tribulation. For those taking notes, Daniel... Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. We read the following. At, the at that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is in charge of your people. And there shall be time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till the time, till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered to everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. As these... Old Testament saints are resurrected and given their resurrected bodies. They're the third army. And the fourth army, these are God's special forces. The fourth army will be made up of the holy angels. Matthew chapter 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, not some of them, all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious Throne. Glory. If you know your scripture, you know the damage that one angel can do. You imagine all the angels of heaven. All those faithful angels, the two-thirds of angels that didn't rebel, will come back. It'd be like, it'd be like I have an, this whole army of special forces guys out there. And they all come. All of us come. I... I don't know, but God's going to teach me how to ride a horse because I don't know how to ride a horse. Sorry. I don't know how. Some of you guys, you're natural to it and you love it. I, not me. I'm going to have to learn how to ride one. Kathy and I don't particularly like horses. Kathy has uh, passed her fear of horses on to me. They're beautiful on that side of the fence. They're just big. <laughs> big. And uh, I don't want nothing to do with them. But I love them. I love to look at them. But one day, one day, believer, you'll be on that horse. 
And some of you are smiling now because you already get to enjoy God's creation now. And, and, but one day we will come and we will ride that horse and we will ride with our king at the head of his armies. Imagine that sight. Jesus comes with us. What John is seeing is you and I as we come with his victorious army. And you know what I love about this? We don't have to do anything. When my sons went off to war, my dad, my grandfather fought in the fields of France in World War I. Unfortunately, came back. My dad fought the Nazis in World War II and came back. I had two sons who fought in the war of terror in Afghanistan and Iraq and came back. They had people shooting at them, and they were shooting back. And so it was always a fear, not for my dad and my grandfather. Obviously, I, 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 it's great you're a hero in my eyes, Dad. But my boys was a different matter. Oh, you know, kind of concerned. And this is a war that we don't have to worry about any casualties. This is a battle that will come, and you're already on the winning side. And we'll be, in my sanctified imagination, I'm like, we're rubbing shoulders with each other. You see what's getting ready to happen? We already know what the book told us. And God will be glorified through all of this. You see, all those that have denied his deity will recognize it. All those have rejected him, he will strike down the nation. God is merciful, but now he will show his wrath. The lamb has returned as the lion. John records that from his mouth comes a sharp sword. The apostle had seen that sword in the earlier vision in chapter 1 verse 16 where it was used to defend the church against the onslaught of Satan's forces. Here it is the sword of judgment. That the sword comes out of his mouth symbolizes the deadly power of Christ's words. The saving power of Christ's words. Oh, I don't know about you, dear one, but when we studied the book of Matthew together and we preached through that all those years, and every time, and to this day, when I hear Jesus, when I read what Jesus says, it, my heart always soars. When, when, we, when, when we sing songs about our Savior. When you, when you worship him and there's smiles upon your lips and there's tears upon your eyes when you sing sometimes. One of, one of the things that always is amazes me is how people can come to church and I don't see you. I, I, one of the reasons I want to sit in the front row is I don't want to look back and see some of y'all's faces when you're worshiping. Because I talk with Pastor Cal sometimes. Pastor Cal says, some people look like they're just mad as fire when they come here on Sunday mornings. No smile on their lips, no joy in their voices. Some people stand there like this. I don't want to see none of that. You'll affect my worship. So I sit right up there. I can't sing worth a lick. But I tell you what, I'm not worried about you during that time. Because I'm praising my King and my Lord. And I have wept on Sunday mornings. Sitting, just standing there, just weeping, thinking of the love that my Savior has for me. That He would die for me. And, and, and when I hear the words, when I read them out loud of what Jesus says and what, how Jesus has given us his word and has taught to us. And, 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 I, and I think about all that comfort and forgiveness that I'm giving and all that mercy and grace that I'm giving. I fear for the one here today who doesn't know that. That there's no lips of, no praise upon your lips. There's no joy in your heart. You're looking for the next thrill in life to get you through and not realizing that the only fulfillment, the only way that you can be fulfilled is to belong to Christ. Because then it doesn't matter if you get the prognosis of cancer and you may only have months to live. You can cry out just like Job. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of God. None of us is getting out of here alive. Okay? Unless the Lord returns, all of us... One day, your pastor is going to pass on. And if God allows me to preach until that day comes, and, and next Sunday there will be another person in the pulpit, you're going to remember some of the things that I've had to say over the years. But I'll be forgotten as a man. Rightfully so. But Christ should be remembered in the way we live our lives. Christ here will use that sword 
to strike down all the nations and all the people who've opposed him. The dead will include all those gathered for the battle of Armageddon. None will escape. Not, not one person will escape. The rest of the world's unredeemed people will be judged and executed at the sheep and goat judgments that was described in Matthew 25 here. This is the final stroke of death in the day of the Lord. John writes that he will tread the winepress of the fury of his wrath. This description of God's wrath comes from the ancient practice of stomping on grapes as part of the wine making process. Some of you have probably seen that when you see people get in, they lift up their skirts or they lift up their pants and they're stepping in their bare feet on, on wine, on, on these grapes to make wine. The splattering of the grape juice pictures the pouring out of the blood of Christ's enemies. Not his blood this time, but the blood of his enemies. In verse 16, on his robe and on his thigh is the name written, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And this is the third name given to the Lord Jesus Christ in this passage. The incomprehensible name of verse 12 may express the mystery of his deity. Verse 13 calls him the Word of God, expressing his incarnation as the Son of God. And the name Lord, uh, excuse me, the name King of Kings and Lord of Lords expresses his sovereign triumph over all of his foes and his absolute rule in his soon to be established kingdom. When he when we enter the millennial kingdom with him and he sets up that thousand year reign and he rules with an iron rod during that time, and you and I will rule with him, and we'll talk about that next week in the millennial kingdom. This is when that all begins. At his second coming. And then finally the final victory. Verses 17 to 21. And here we see another angel. This time he is standing in front of the sun. And and as angels have done numerous times in Revelation. The angel cries out with a loud voice. And he commands all the birds. To feed on the results of the slaughter. That will shortly follow. Again not a bedtime story for children. The angel is declaring the victory of Jesus Christ. Before the battle is ever fought. He summons, the the summonsing of the birds is a reminder to us of Jesus' words. Let me refresh your memory from Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 27. This is Christ talking. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. And whoever the corpse, excuse me, wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Jesus talking about the battle of Armageddon when he was telling his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew. The angel commands the birds to come and assemble for the great supper of God. This will not be the first time that the birds have feasted on human flesh in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 18 verse 6 describing the results of judgment on Cush, which is modern Ethiopia. They will be left together for mountain birds of prey and for the beast of the earth. And the birds of prey will spend the summer feeding on them. This is the enemies of God. Verse 17 and 18 are a picture taken directly from the Old Testament, from Ezekiel's picture of the slaughter of the forces forces of Gog and Magog. In Ezekiel chapter 39, Ezekiel 39 starting at verse 17. Speak to the birds of every sort and to all beasts of the field. Assemble and come. Gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you. A great sacrifice, a sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel. And you shall eat flesh and drink blood. You shall eat the flesh of the mighty and drink the blood of the princes of the earth. Of rams, of lambs, and of goats, of bulls, and all them fat beasts of Basham. And you shall eat fat till you are filled and drink blood till you are drunk at the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you. This is a description of what the animals will be doing when God destroys all of these evil people on the world. Not one will remain. I had somebody come to me after the first service and say, Pastor, it's hard to believe there's going to be anybody left after all the things we read about, about the judgments from the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls. When, how is there going to be anybody left? I said, there are going to be people left. The shocking thing for me is, how are they still unbelievers? How do you see all this Transpire, all it reminds me is how hardened and how wicked a man's heart is. And unless God chooses to open our eyes and make dead men and dead women alive in him, we will die in our sin. In Revelation chapter 14, 
we see the description of the battle, which I preached on a couple of weeks ago, about the blood rising up to the bridle of, of the horses and it being 200 miles long. One commentator put it like this. Whether there are actual horses involved or not, sees this as a hyperbole to suggest the slaughter in which blood will splatter into the air profusely along the whole length of this 200-mile battlefield. And when the slaughter reaches its peak, blood could not flow through its troughs and stream beds, unquote. No matter what, it, what happens there, the Bible wants to share with you that it will be a mass slaughter of God's enemies. And Armageddon will actually, as I just said, it's not going to be a battle. It's going to be a slaughter. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all the human and demonic forces will be immediately destroyed. Verse 19. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war with him who sits on his horse and with his army. In the next event in John's vision, he sees the beast of the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against Christ. The beast is the Antichrist. He's the leader of the last and greatest empire this world will ever see. The kings of the earth are the ten kings who rule the ten sectors into which the Antichrist worldwide empire is divided in chapter 17 of Revelation. The armies have assembled to make war against him who sat on the throne. And they, the, the, the apparently invisible armed might of the beast will be all the firepower that waits for the arrival of Christ himself. But before there is a battle, it's all over. Every person lives by the mercy of God. Do you understand that this morning? Everybody. And God created the heavens and the earth. He gave you life. Do you realize how much of your body has to work every day for you to function? I mean, the older you get, you experience that in bucketfuls. You go hop out of bed like you used to. You don't jump. People say, well, put a little bit more pep in your step, Pastor. Well, when you get to be 66 years old, you tell me about pep in your step. But you think about all the things that have to work. In the very breath that we breathe, God gives to us. In an instant, he could take any one of us home. And at this instant, he destroys all the armies of his enemies. Verse 20, in an instant, the beast was captured. And with the false prophet who is in the presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped the uh, the, his image. So the, these two demon-controlled human beings, remember the Antichrist is the political leader, the false prophet is the religious leader, are thrown alive, Scripture tells us, into the lake of fire. These are the first two occupants of the lake of fire. There's nobody in permanent hell now. The last place it was created for the devil and his angels. The devil's not in there. Nobody's in there. Even the demons that are being held until they're released in Revelation are held not there. They're held in the holding place where there is still suffering. And every person who's died outside of Christ, they're suffering now. Not in their glorified bodies. When I say glorified, the bodies that are given for them to suffer through eternity with. But these two are the first two thrown into the, to hell. Hell has always existed. But this is its final form. Unlike Hades, the lake of fire is not a temporary holding place, but a permanent place of imprisonment and punishment. And we know that the beast and the false prophet are still in the lake of fire a thousand years later, because we know that from Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. This does away with those people who teach the false doctrine of annihilation, which says that when you, go to, when you die, God may punish you for a while, but you will be finally annihilated, and you're soul will not live forever. That's not what scripture tells us. In verse 21, and the rest were killed with the sword which came from the mouth of him who sits on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. John Phillips describes this. Quote, then suddenly it will be all over. In fact, there will be no war at all. In the sense that we think of war, there will be just a word spoken from him who sits astride the great white horse. Once he spoke a word to a fig tree and it withered away. Once he spoke a word to howling winds and heaving waves and the storm clouds vanished and the waves fell still. Once he spoke to a legion of demons bursting at the seams of a poor man's soul and instantly they fled. Now he speaks a word and the war is over. 
The blasphemous, loud-mouthed beast is stricken where he stands. The false prophet, the miracle-working windbag from the pit is punctured and still. The pair of them are bundled up and hurled headlong into the everlasting flames. Another word, and the panic-stricken armies reel and stagger and fall down dead. Field marshals and generals, admirals and air commanders, soldiers and sailors, rank and file, one and all, they fall, and the vultures descend and cover the sea. That is what happens when God comes back, when Jesus comes and he reclaims to be rightful heir of this world. So I leave you with this question this morning. Where will you be when this great battle happens? Where will you be? If you're a believer and follow Christ, you will be with me on a horse and you'll be with your king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And we will return with him and we will reign with him in the millennial kingdom. If you die without Christ, you'll be in the holding place waiting for the final judgment at the great white throne judgment of God where God will cast all those who denied his son into the lake of fire where there'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth where the fire is never quenched and where there's utter darkness. You have a choice this morning, dear one. Fall on your face figuratively before a holy God this morning. Recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and that only Jesus can save you. What say you? What holds you back? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Christian, when we read this, you know, it's, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's not a fairy tale. It's not a story we share, tell our children to, to make them excited and tell them about what God's going to do when he comes back. But to us as believers, when we see the lamb who was slain and we see him as the lion of Judah, as we see him as the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and we rejoice with that, we pray to him. And I pray that you join me in that prayer that come, Lord, come quickly. Come, take your church home, and then come, Father. Send your Son to reclaim this earth. I pray that you pray that prayer with me. But in the meantime, Christian, would, would, would you commit to live a life that reflects that the gospel that's in you is coming out of you? Would you, would you live a life that others see as one of hope and not despair? Would you live a life that no matter what trials and tribulations that you have, that you can with joy, even in the midst of sorrow, give praises to God? God said He came to save us and He gives us peace. My peace, I leave you. Do you understand that, Christian? If, you're, if you don't have peace in your life right now, you're being disobedient to God. You're allowing the prayers of the world to interfere with the promises that Christ gave to you. And to the one who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I beg you. I beg you that even now, if you're listening to me and you don't believe what I have to say, I pray that you open up the book yourself, the Bible, study it, be open-minded as you do. And I I know that if you do that, you become honestly seeking and ask God to reveal himself to you, he will do that very thing. In just a moment, I'll stand up front here after I pray. And I invite you to come and to grab this preacher by the hand. And if you've received Christ as Savior, the Bible tells us to make that public. I, I'd be honored and privileged to pray with you over your decision. However, God's leading you this day. If it's to join the church, to be a part of this fellowship. If God has worked in a way in your life today that I could never even begin to understand or imagine, but the Holy Spirit has worked in you and you want me to pray with you, I, I'm here as well. And I'll remain after this service. I'm here. If you want to do it in the privacy of my office, you just come and you see me. Whatever how God's leading you, please don't leave this place without making it right with God. Father, 
I thank you for what has transpired here today, Lord. And may your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. You come as the Lord leads, as Pastor Kyle leads us.